So if you're somebody who does not believe in cryptocurrency and you're not there and you are heading the reserve bank of the country, that industry is going to fall backwards because you are taking too long to understand and adopt mm. and uh, apply policy. Hello everyone, you are listening to Mutual Knowledge. I'm Gauthier Lamotte, your host, and today I am interviewing Desirin Dong from Learn Crypto, live from the African Blockchain Conference in South Africa, in Johannesburg. And this is great, thanks to Homegrown Radio, a company in South Africa who's providing the media coverage. We're doing this live podcast. Hi, Desiree. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for having me as well, because I'm super excited to have just this media coverage Rage, you know, I, I usually know. I do remote podcasts and it's much more human to have people face to face. And that's what I love about the crypto world. We are spontaneous, we're just happy go lucky, remove all the fluff, get get to the point, get working. <laughs> yeah. My my girlfriend would tell you, Oh, let's keep some fluff, but that's because she likes fluffy things. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, you know, it's funny because I think we could write a book about all the anecdotes in the crypto space of all these right. th these collaborations or mm -hmm. uh, encounters that started spontaneously like this. Yes. Especially during this adoption phase, right? <laughs> yeah. Early days of adoption, very important. So, Desiree, uh, how did you come to the blockchain space? Oh, man. So, I'm a, being a crypto enthusiast, I'm always looking for people that are playing within the same space. So. I sit on the internet and I look for events that are related to blockchain and cryptocurrencies within the continent and outside of Africa. So in May, I'm going to the Bitcoin conference in Miami. Um, I was invited to the ETH Denver just recently in Colorado, but I wasn't able to made it, make it. It was quite short, short notice. And, uh, and then traveling to Kenya, um, Rwanda, Uganda. Just, I, I'm a crypto curious. I'm, I, I'm crypto curious and I'm also an, an, an enthusiast. And I'm a Bitcoin miner, I'm a trader and an investor. So I'm just, I'm, I'm totally absorbed within the space. Jack of all trades <laughs> in the crypto world. All right. Yeah. And so, um, what was your first encounter with it? My first encounter, uh, gosh, it, it goes all the way back to the early 90s when, when the internet first arose and just got to prominence uh, early 90s around about 94 93 94 for me uh, I started seeing the the emerging technology and I thought oh wow this is going to be the big buzz and from that time I started chasing the internet of things at the time and I was like I want to have my own laptop I want to be connected to the internet I want to be doing everything that is related to internet websites and so on so I went into that and then that was web two. And then uh, fast forward, I was still, because I'm always curious about emerging markets, emerging tech, I had the first iPhone all the way to the iPhone now. So that, that <laughs> so was in 1993? 93, when I started just being curious about so emerging th that technology. That was the year when the first Jurassic Park was released. I was seven years old. Oh, God. I feel so little. That, that's feel so great. So old. You can't <laughs> say things like that. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, when when I first heard the crypto buzz, I was surfing the internet and uh, following the Silicon Valley geeks and listening to what they are talking about. What is it that they chasing in the future of technology? And I came across crypto. I came across Bitcoin, and I started chatting to some of them. And uh, we started talking about mining, and I, I really immersed myself into the blockchain space. And that's when I started buying my first Bitcoin as well in 2015. And then uh, into 2017, when um, I was interested in Ether. And as the years went by, I started buying more types of uh, cryptocurrencies, XRP, um, Cardano, Solana, and so on and so on. So I've got my portfolio of crypto. And, uh, and then with Bitcoin, when, when we went up to the big bull markets, I bought myself a farm. Uh, and we, <laughs> I know it's crazy. And I started farming livestock and um, started farming uh, with bees, honey bees. Okay. So we have a huge apiary and we're registered uh, with the Department of uh, Agriculture and we produce honey and um, 
we create foraging for the bees, we plant all sorts of plants, uh, lavender, so it's a multi-flora uh, product that we produce on the farm. And uh, Bitcoin mining, we substitute some of it with uh, solar energy, so we just got a whole lot going on. So like a whole portfolio of things going on and then within the farm we then wow. started because we wanted to be known and heard and seen so we thought what is another platform that we can use to be seen and heard we thought okay let's open up a radio station so this is all in 2021 when we are confused we don't know if we're going to make it to the following year and uh, let's let's make our purpose meaningful in this planet while we are here in this one year we might be dead the following year so we started opening up all these little things open up a radio station, set up the apiary. We moved into the farm on the eve of COVID, which is in uh, January of 2020. We had no idea that COVID was going to happen. And when we got there, we were able to produce food for our entire community very fast. So we put up a greenhouse tunnel and we produced food. So we were doing all these things that we had. My, my son called us YouTube farmers <laughs> and, and YouTube miners. <laughs> <laughs> so we started doing all these things. You know, Steve Jobs, he, he, when, when he was about to, um, when he was struggling with cancer in his last days, yeah. he spoke about how if we all knew when we were going to die, we would already live within our purpose, mm -hmm. the reason that we brought in to do in this earth to do. So when we went into COVID, the, those, the, the words of Steve Jobs, kept ringing in my head. Of course, I'm just totally paraphrasing what he said, but I thought if we, if, if we were not going to be around the following year, what is it that we could do this year to make an impact in our lives or in our communities? So I thought bees are very important. We need bees to pollinate our plants. Um, and we have the bees, we have the sunshine, and we are in Africa, so let's opportunize on that. And it's a, an easy, it's a quick win. If you want to farm anything that is easy, bees is your best bet. The low maintenance, but if you manage it well, it gives you good yields. And then farming, producing food. There's nothing that is more rewarding, rewarding than farming where you pl plant a seed, you nourish the soil, feed it with water and nutrients, and it is bound to give you a reward after a certain period of time. So that is, is just, it's just a proper analogy of life. What, what you put into the ground and how well you nurture it, even if it's relationships or family, whatever you put in, you're going to get out. Same thing with the cryptocurrency and the blockchain chases. If we continue to look for and nurture relationships in the space, it will pay off in the future. That's wonderful. So let me ask the question as a guy who mostly work with European and, um, and American people mm. from the blockchain space. How is the market in, uh, in South Africa and in Africa in general, because we, you've been around from mm -hmm. what I hear, um, are people using it with use cases like to pay their, um, their stuff every day? For example, last week I interviewed a girl from Georgia who told me like, that people are paying their coffee. Grandmothers are using this to pay, their, pay for their pastry. How's it going in South Africa? You know, Africa as a whole is seen as a continent that usually is a consumer rather than a creator. Mm -hmm. So the, the big word, the, my, my first answer is education. Education is key. And I think that with the advent of the internet and people literally living in their gadgets, they're able to access various information. There's so much um, stuff that you can find on the internet with regards to any emerging technology. So unlike in the past where people, there was the huge digital give, uh, divide or the information gap, you weren't able to get information unless you went to university. And if you were in university, you studied for a specific thing that, you know, that you, you're looking for there. But with this huge information flow, uh, with the internet of things, Anybody, anywhere can access information, but what we need to do, because we are all vying for the same ear, we have, there's a lot of information vying for the same ear, and uh, so it's a competition of the destination of the information that you are serving. So adoption is key, and how well you can make noise around your product so that people know about your product. So I always say that it does not matter how much money an investor puts into their project. If they do, do not have a good marketing or a good 
adoption strategy, that product is just going to sit there and serve very little purpose. And uh, shareholders will not be able to see their returns as, as well as they would like. So adoption and collaboration. So if, if you're in, in, in Europe, do things like that, do such things that you are doing, which is come out to the continent, suss us out, meet us, have relationships with us, so that we can find the sweet spots that we can collaborate on. Of course. And um, we are here. We're hungry. We just probably don't travel as much as we should, uh, probably should. But once you get here, you'll see that there's many, many points that are untapped that you can play with. And adoption is very important. So with adoption comes education. So we educate for adoption, but we also find strategies on retention of whatever it is that we're learning about the emerging technology. At this space, uh, Africa needs a way or, or ha needs solutions to move money safely um, uh, with the knowledge that it's going to reach its destination and also within a regulated space. I know people do not like the word regulation, but regulation is critical. It serves purposes for the people that are sending their money and those that are receiving. It's, it's a good purpose for business as well. It's good use cases. It's, uh, uh, whoever's pri providing a, an efficient, affordable, easy to understand solution in movement of money or digital assets is going to be the winner. So basically, any payment solution in the future that allows people to avoid either corruption or transfer loss or huge fees uh, would be something that would solve a problem in, in many territories in Africa. Because if you look at the protocol, the, the Bitcoin protocol that was released by Satoshi Nakamoto, it, it, the, the, the ethics behind it was almost a, a sort of a, what you would call a political movement, a, a social movement to say, to speak, which was retaliating against the, uh, the fall of the uh, markets in 2008. Of course. To say, you've had, so we've trusted you so much with our money and our investments, and you've not been true. You've not pl played fairly. And uh, we, we, we've invested all of our trust in you but you've not been able to manage and prevent or, 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 or proactively avoid this downfall, this economic downfall. And you're not proactively preventing the economic downfall of the countries that rely on you. So how do, what is the best thing that we can do to get our power back to us, keep our money and our investments sort of intact in or just even just a, a tip of the iceberg in terms of how we can regain that uh, power is the Bitcoin protocol. Yeah. But how do people understand that through education? Without education, people don't know that this, this product was designed to be a solution to a problem that you probably don't even know you have. You know, you know it's interesting because in France, most people, when they hear about Bitcoin, think it's a Ponzi scheme Absolutely. or uh, even uh, hear about the IMF renting about how dangerous Bitcoin would be because mm. it could fund terrorism or yeah. well we know that the, the currency funding uh, terrorism yeah. the most is probably U the US dollar yeah. but because not because America's bad or anything just mm. because it's a very powerful currency and yeah. if B Bitcoin becomes more powerful there will be bad people doing stuff yes. with it but not because the currency is bad yeah. and it's interesting that yes indeed education is what will drive adoption mm -hmm. so is that um, what crypto. you're doing at learn crypto, learn crypto Africa. this leads us to that so we host a series of free educational programs on learn crypto africa so it's learn crypto zero one dot com so we we host live face-to-face -face seminars we host podcasts we use some celebrities to help to hype up our events uh, and we collaborate with the likes of Bitcoin events. And so we, we, we do a lot to try and get that mileage and that attention that we would like to get from uh, the audiences that we pursue. We go to graduates, we go to universities. Uh, the future is your graduates, the future is the youth. So we target a lot of our youth. The quicker that they can understand the future of money or blockchain technology, the better it will be for all of us. And so do you think the most promising is the technical youth, like computer science uh, students, or Absolutely. the business uh, Well, youth? both. 
you yeah. need both. You, you need both. You need business to drive the technical or to drive things. So um, data science is an, impo an important subject matter. Uh, just understanding uh, how to build products and, and services within the, 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 the digital space, whether it's you're on Web3, you're creating NFTs, or you're, you're creating FinTech products, just that understanding. So just maybe youngsters could also relook at the things that they're going to study. Uh, some things will be absolutely redundant in the future, unnecessary completely, because robotics and AI will take over. So what are these products that we can uh, encourage youngsters to look into that will help them to advance their careers, but also keep them relevant in the future? Mm. And so every time we see in the news uh, popping up the fact that an African country has been, uh, is considering adopting Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency as a legal tender, that's a good news for you, right? Yeah. Tunisia, by the way. Uh, oh. re, uh, that adopted I didn't know. Bitcoin as a legal tender. When, when was that? Uh, was it last year or the previous year? Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I even missed that. Yeah, so many <laughs> I know. things happening. There was a big hype about uh, Argentina at some at some and stage. Salvador. How and are they doing? Are they still? Uh, well, you know, it's all. Um, some critics will say that yeah, you know, every time there's a bear market, some people will say, "Oh, I told you so. This will happen badly." Yeah. And when the market is good, some people right. will say, "Oh, that's great." It's very hard to interpret the curves without without having an ideological bias. So l just let let's wait and see. Just that. Well, the banks in South Africa, and I'm told that all the banks in South Africa are currently working with digital assets, and they're also contributing to the um, the regulatory space. So I think that the future is bright where adoption of digital assets are concerned within the banks. Mm -hmm. Although my concern sometimes is still like, who's, what is the vested interest where the banks are concerned? I mean, the, the whole, the, the, the movement was mm -hmm. a, re a rebellion against the centralized p dispositions of the banks. How can the banks play a part where they so, sort of decentralize, reducing the costs and fees for us to be able to trade with various um, uh, entities. May I suggest a hypothesis? Mm -hmm. I think that every time that there's a disrupting technology, there are people who are saying, no, we have to fight that technology to keep our pow power. Mm -hmm. And some of us who are like, okay, le we're going to lose some of our power, but if we act nicely and if yes. we play along and say that this is a great technology, we might stay in place. Like all the countries in Europe that kept a king yeah. A king, they all said, oh, the, the king said, oh, we should have parliament and democracy. So yeah. I, should be, I shall be remembered as the king who brought democracy. Yeah. I relinquished my power, but I'm still here. Right. And so that's why in Belgium, mm -hmm. that's why in, uh, in England, in all, all of these countries, they, they didn't, you know, just dismantle the kingdom. They just had a kingdom with a constitution and some kind of democracy because... Yeah. The, 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 kingdom, the king was smart enough to say, okay, they're going to execute me if I'm not yeah. relinquishing a bit Absolutely. of my power. So let's keep 20% of something instead, instead of 0% of nothing. Strategic adoption. <laughs> uh, that that's my working hypothesis. I don't know what, what it you makes think about absolute it. sense. It makes. I mean, if you don't do it, you're going to be shut out. I mean, even with uh, uh, the inception of um, social media platforms, uh, lots of companies felt, oh, we won't go into Facebook. That is not. That's a trashy place to be. We're going to stick with magazines and radio and billboards. In and Africa? Look where they are now. No, oh, but uh, generally. Oh, yeah, I yeah, mean, I know big companies oh, even oh, in oh, Europe. Oh, yeah, you mean they refused adoption. Yeah, that, is, that was the issue back then. Like, we're not going to go, we're not going to cheapen our brands by being on Facebook. But look where everyone is now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Five years from now, you're going <laughs> to... Yeah. Say that in 2005. And the early adopters are the regret. ones that actually won. They they, they had the most uh, luck uh, by adopting earlier. The of course, and yeah, that's a, that's a risk and a leap of faith, of course. And so, um, in your opinion, what are the main struggles for either the regulatory concerns or the business concerns in uh, in Africa and in South Africa? Um, to, to make the blockchain market more mainstream? I think the, 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 my, my concern, my, what I worry about is the mindset block by the decision makers mm. and the regulators. Uh, if, if you're sitting in a position where you will make changes, uh, you're supposed to make changes with an emerging tech, 
and your mind is blocked to it, towards it, that entire tenor while you're serving uh, in, that, in office is going to be wasted where the emerging tech is concerned. So if you're somebody who does not believe in cryptocurrency and you're not there and you are heading the reserve bank of the country, that industry is going to fall backwards because you are taking too long to understand and adopt mm. and uh, apply policy. Okay, That's so they, that is the challenge. So the big guys need to quickly understand. And how do we get them to quickly understand what is happening? Education, again, probably. Education. Are they willing to be educated? So these are the things that we need to kick doors for. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So th th that's a big challenge. Because the day-to-day the, the -day person is going to adopt whatever is put to them. This, this is hard because governments have an, a strong incentive not to be educated. That's the problem. But uh, not only in Africa, in Look most countries. Look what's happening in the U.S. Uh, yeah. There's gatekeeping everywhere. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, super high GDP countries and super powerful in the top seven countries are not necessarily better off yeah. because they have a lot of inertia as well. Also, the fact that uh, many people that hold a lot of power, they still hold it in the fiat mindset. Yes. Right? And so if you hold a lot of power, and that power has is, is got to do with decision making, if, you, if you're controlling the borders, you're controlling the ports, and you're controlling trade and industry, and your mindset is within the fear or the old way of doing things, then you're going to slow down the entire process for the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, so it takes people like myself and yourself and all the tech companies to say, let's Let's move faster. Let's kick these doors quicker. Let's influence the industry faster. Remember the protocol back in uh, 2008. It was saying we are rebelling against the old ways of doing things. But we have to move towards power back to the people. So if there ever was such a thing. May I ask a question that basically would piss off any government member? <laughs> What do you think about using the blockchain technology to establish a decentralized voting system? <laughs> because we, I mean, let's face it, in the, in the, in the past four, three, four years, oh. we've been talking about many election frauds uh, in many countries. So what would happen, if a con in your opinion, if a country so were to adopt a decentralized voting system? I am always talking about the decentralized voting system. Can you imagine the problems that it would solve? But like you say, it's not in the interest of the power. So I can imagine the problem it would solve, but I, co I can also imagine the people it would piss off. <laughs> you and I can imagine how great it would be. In mm -hmm. fact, if we ran many things, even if you ran the medical system on the blockchain, if I traveled to France and I suddenly felt sick, shortness of breath, and I needed an x-ray, I should not have to take another x-ray and pay X amount of euros when I have one that was taken last week and that doctor could have a seamless flow of my medical history and not have to start from scratch diagnosing me and therefore finding the right treatment mm. it would solve the pharmaceutical issues it would definitely solve the the, the voting system and, and influence democracy in a whole new level it's funny that you're mentioning uh, medical data because as a Frenchman, I live in La France, which is one of the most centralized country, countries um, in the world regarding mm -hmm. the health system. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is, we have something popping in the news every year about a centralized government agency that wasn't able to effectively secure the personal data of customers and, and now, oh, sorry, ma'am, a few hackers have your medical data and they know that you have a bladder cancer. Oh, oh sorry. And, and every time it happens over and over again, but we hear sometimes, no, we couldn't use the blockchain for this. But in French, we have a proverb saying the, the worm is in the fruit, me meaning it's too late. The idea is propagating itself. Yeah. And if the FDA in the U.S. is already using the blockchain to, you know, to track supply chain issues, yes. it means that blockchain is here to stay. It is definitely here to stay. The question is adoption mm -hmm. and uh, retention, adoption and retention of users 
which is going to be key. There's going to be a lot of bad players that are going to be acting in bad faith. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be able to very quickly identify them and avoid them or break them down. So being a movement means that there's a lot of work that needs to be done by the likes of Blockchain Africa conferences, by your likes, the, the, the likes of the, the podcasters, the Learn Crypto Africa, your podcast, from anybody that is interested in doing good and, and in fighting against the disparities that exist between countries, between people, mm -hmm. Um, the economic the, the, the economic disparities that exist and, and just f continuously fighting you know, and yeah. this, this blockchain technology is the solution you, you know I find it extremely inspiring to hear you uh, say that let, let me uh, allow me to rephrase to make sure I understood you properly you're basically saying we have to be proactive with the bad players to. to avoid the bad reputation and to make sure the blockchain sector is healthy as a whole, right? And no one else is going to do it. Mm -hmm. Government is not going to s suddenly uh, run programs to educate people about blockchain technology. And the press won't do it either. Neither will the banks, mm -hmm. nor will media. <laughs> it's not in their interest. So it's the, it's the people that are following that protocol that says that this is power back to the people. Mm -hmm. And it's a unifier of things. Uh, it's uh, very inspiring to hear you sp uh, speak about that because um, a few months ago I interviewed my, I interviewed my own CEO, Alexander Smart, mm -hmm. at Moon, and he said exactly the same thing. Like one of the main struggles of the market is not regulation or technical aspects or scalability or whatever. No, it's the fact that we're not proactively taking down the bad players and one day this will backfire against us. Absolutely, absolutely. So we all have our hands, set, our work set out for us. We have a lot to do we've got a lot of education to do and especially if you're creating products you're going to need customers for those products and we almost have to create our own customers right we have to make we have to be our own influences mm. uh, for the products that we, crea we are creating so we, it, there's a lot of work that needs to be done remember what the, what we are fighting a corrupt movement a corrupt disposition and in that corruption, there's always uh, future uh, customers of corruption. There's a supply and demand side to corruption, right? So the corruptors will always be looking for new customers of their corruption. Let us not be the customers. Let's, let us be the, the, that force that is moving people to the other solution. Decentralization, yeah. transparency, security, safety, power back to the people having power over where your money goes when you put your money in investments. Yeah, just like there will not be no scam on the internet. And w when I was younger, there were, uh, I received many, I used to receive a spam every week telling me that some Nigerian prince wanted to share his money with me, <laughs> but it doesn't exist anymore. So it means that the scam doesn't work anymore and it people are not, work. they're not wasting their time doing it because they know people are educated. With education. So that Absolutely. means education helps. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're on the same page with that. Well, thank you so much about everything. Thank you for um, having me. Any last word, any last project you want to share with us? I would just like to say that uh, we're excited that South Africa is hosting programs that are bringing people from the West, uh, people from all over, and people, uh, tech organizations that are coming through and identifying and recognizing where the sweet spots are that we can talk about and collaborate. I know that when the West comes to Africa, sometimes it's not always for good purposes. <laughs> it's not always for a symbiotic relationship, but I'd like us to see, I'd like to see us moving towards collaborations that benefit us uh, for the long term uh, and for future generations, not just a quick spur of the moment and get out and once we've gotten what we can get. And uh, I'd also like us to, to, to reach out more uh, to, to the rest of the, 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 the world and, and find solutions that are going to better our lives and the lives of the future generations. Thank you so much, Desiree. Thank you. Everyone, this was Mutual Knowledge. You were listening to Desiree Ndong, founder of Learn Crypto and many other projects. Please look her up. Like, share and subscribe our podcast and stay tuned for more interviews of very inspiring people.